over three years ago, I visited CETA and I basically gave a Blackboard talk at the cosmology lunch there about land testing about the power spectra. Um, and all I can say about that talk is I'm surprised uh, CETA still hired me after that talk. We'll see how this one goes. So the, the general idea with line testing mapping is you have an observer here, you know, looking through into the sky and trying to look at all of these galaxies and all of this gas and dust and whatever. And you're trying to trace out the large scale structure, the, the cosmic web that these objects and this media, these media are tracing. And Conventionally, what you would do is you'd say, okay, we're gonna we're, we're gonna do this by identifying individual galaxies, you know, individual targets across the sky, different kinds of emission line galaxies, you know, quasars, what have you. And then you say, okay, this is a biased tracer of your large scale structure. And that tells you something about the cosmology that these galaxies live in. Now, the paradigm of line testing mapping is the flat twist on that, which is your observables are not discrete objects, but rather the line intensity field associated with the underlying objects, as well as in some cases, the underlying media. So, you know, different objects will have different brightnesses. This is obviously a schematic. But you can imagine basically different levels of line emission and what whatever line you're targeting. And you say, okay, now I'm interested in surveying this field of line intensity and how that responds to the underlying presence of dark matter um, or you know, matter in general. And I'll, this is the thing about Blackboard thought should never tell how an effect is going to go. But basically, you know, in a line testing observation, you're not really trying to resolve the image objects. The whole thing is blurred out uh, because you're not designing, you know, the next LSST or the next mega mapper. You're designing so basically because they're small to mid-scale facilities a lot of cases. So your picture of this ends up being blurred. But nonetheless, the idea is that you have sufficient resolution with your instrument to trace the overall fluctuations at large scales, uh, linear to you know quasi linear scales in the line intensity field. Um, and that should give you enough leverage to uh, make astrophysical and cosmological constraints about the underlying population. So not the most conventional survey, but there is a shared thing in that you're very interested in modeling the effect of you know the underlying dark matter halos on your observables. So this talk in particular, I'm focusing on single dish. So we're not really thinking about things like you know trying so much, but trying to drop into parametric and the instant response becomes a lot more complicated when it comes to observables. And I'm also assuming halo modelable, oh sorry, halo modelable observables, uh, by which I mean okay, like if you go out to really high red disk. What dominates certain things like H1 intensity mapping is not really the contribution from individual halos. It's really, you know, the individual halos are still trying to ionize the intergalactic medium. And what you're seeing with what you would see with an experiment like Hera is basically a Swiss cheese in H1. And that's not really something where the halo dominates, it's something where there's dominant field component. And I'm not going to get into that so much. Uh, the stuff I work on in particular is really looking at things like CO lines and uh, part, I mean, sort of carbon lines, these sort of far infrared star formation lines, um, or or sort of other you know atomic molecular gas lines that are mostly confined to the interstellar medium. And so in that case, you can basically say, okay, this is really tracing the visual galaxies, just at a not nearly in a fully resolved level. So as an example. You know, let me sketch out, you know, an example instrument, you know, you have to seal map, right? Same kind of seal map. Um, so seal map is primary to CO1 to zero and CO2 to one. These are rotational transitions of the CO molecule, 115 megahertz, right frame. 
frequency indicators. <coughs> oh, sorry, frequency. Um, the observing band of this is going to be something like 26 to 34 gigahertz and 12 to 20 gigahertz. This is what's operational now. This is something we're going to get funded at some point. Um, so for this, um, the current system has a frequency resolution of something on the order of natively two megahertz, but it's really something our science analyzation goes on like 32 megahertz, which corresponds to a velocity width around 300 kilometers per second. Um, so for reference, this will come up later as well. This is a regime where we're barely resolving individual line throw files for AC emitters. Um, and then you don't actually, we still don't resolve individual emitters because our beam width, the full width and half maximum of the beam profile is like five arc minutes. The fish is a tender fish. So these are the kinds of parameters you're working with. You're certainly, you know, not trying to resolve individual galaxies that are in CO. You're trying to resolve the clustering features at, at larger scales, not so much the very, very fine stuff. So with that in mind, I'm going to start sketching out the observables that are at work. So the principal thing, because line testing having basically started as a bunch of Sandy people thinking about CO, and that uh, because of that, the approach is very cosmological, which means that people start thinking it just immediately in terms of power spectrum. So that is the that is one of the principal observables that people credit with these terms is the power spectrum at large scales of this line density field. And if you cut to the chase, in real cooling space, what this power spectrum looks like is basically something that can be written like this. So part of this is corresponding to the clustering that I was talking about before. The other part of this is shot noise. So even though we're not dealing with discrete emitters, the fact that the underlying emitters are discrete galaxies still introduces some kind of quantum component here. And then of course, what we're really interested in is this component, the large scale clustering of the line emission field. And basically, as I said, we're going to focus on states where the field model. So then that means trying to figure out, okay, what is what is the amplitude of this shock noise? What is this parameter, which is basically like a, like a dimensional bias with which your line intensity power spectrum is tracing the matter power spectrum? This is in a bondism, this is the response function. Right. And the response function. Do you have a question? Mark? Yes. Um, yeah, that's good. So, um, can you be sure that the CO emissions ought to be then? Right. Um, this will depend on the environmental conditions. Uh, it's going to, you know, especially as you go back, back further in redshift. Uh, for now, we basically assume that those kinds of radius transfer details are not uh, too influential. Um, but Certainly, especially at the early times, is something we'll really want to get a better handle. So do you mean the object clips in the universe or in the ISM? Or just ISM? Oh, ISM. But in the ISM, right, the lines, the individual lines are optically thick for a given atom, but of course, there are big velocity shears in the galaxies. So the effect of octave depth is only a border less. You basically you can see all the emission. 
because it's not blocked by other lines yeah. because of the velocity spread. And the individual lines are narrow, but the turbulent velocities are much bigger than the thermal velocities. So the thermal optical depths are bigger than one, but they're coming from a bunch of lots of small patches of spectrometers. That's why you can see, that's why you get the mass of the GMC out of the CO image. It's not obvious beforehand. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. Confused. Could, I just confused the question. But um, yeah, I mean, we do, we do, we are like, if you look at surveys like Olma, they do surveys over much smaller targeted fields. And they basically try to say, okay, I have to send the drop to Can I look for individual peaks that are on the CO emission? And they have had some success based on constraint of loss function, things like that. So CO is definitely visible. Most of the CO starburst. They're not really starburst. They're, they're L star galaxies at a good pressure. But is it clear though in all cases? I mean, to zero yes, it's, it really is not. Good. I mean, it's kind of a weird. I They are optically thick, but the, the amount of actual shadowing is not as high as you think because there are the big turbulent yeah. losses. Yeah. If you just did the atomic physics and didn't know about turbulence, they were they're really optically thick. But because you have these really broad turbulent losses, the effective alignments are, are like even the Milky Way at five kilometers a second versus the thermal alignment, which is or CO like a hundredth of a kilometer. So, so you spread it out by a factor of a hundred, and it's not optically that you can okay. That was not obvious for a long time. This is a very famous paper by Goldberg and Kwan where they pointed this effect out. I feel like very little about CO physics is very obvious. <laughs> yeah. As as yeah, we're trying to follow this this thing, the response function, or um, the parlance we use at Stanford was the Galton Yellow connection. But really, at the end of the day, what it comes down to in the first instance is say, okay, if I have a given halo, a dark matter halo, with some material mass and some redshift. What is the line luminosity corresponding to that? And you can take that and you can say, okay, well, then, given that halo mass, halos at a given halo mass are a biased tracer of dark matter distribution such that essentially, you know, power, you know, the, the power of the density contracts for. Given halo mass, some bias parameter that is mass dependent times the matter part spectrum. Given this linear bias assumption, then you can go back and say, okay, well, this in turn, this dimensional bias, the line density bias, is going to be something like something proportional to the first moment of the luminosity function, really. But we have to relate that back to halos. You can see that what this really wants to be is something like L D N, but it can't be because we need to relate this back to how it responds to dark matter presence. And then the shot noise is going to do something similar. Where it's like the second moment. And it's really something like this. You can see it's basically the variance of the luminosity <laughs> density field. But again, in halo model parlance, it's going to be something like. Okay. Fine. So the first order, this is what your power spectrum looks like. You have a clustering component that is proportional to the first moment of your luminosity, the average luminosity that's basically, and then you have a shot noise component reflecting the small scale, you know, reflecting the scale of the independent fluctuations of your line density field that reflect the variance of your luminosity density field. Um, second moment of luminosity. 
this all looks quite handy, but this is in real space. Actual real physical, not physical, but actual real cooling space, which is not our observational space. Observational space is not something where it's, you know, you have an X, a Y, and a Z. It's not like that. In fact, it's really like you have a theta, X, theta, Y, and then you have, well, it's still Z because it's redshift, <laughs> but you get the point. It's not actual line of sight coming coordinate, it's redshift. So what does that do, right? And it's probably more helpful to see with cartoons in terms of what you basically think they expect. So. Okay. So suppose you have, you know, this over density with, you know, some surroundings, fine. But in the first instance, focus on the over density. And you have lots of different line emitters living inside this kind of super cluster structure. In the first instance, what you're going to see happening, if you have this transverse direction and you have redshift, right? In the first instance, you have Kaiser 1987, the Kaiser effect, which is that if you have an over density like this, there will be coherent infall of these sources into the over density. This collective motion, in turn, results in what appears to be, in retro space, a squashed over density. So this actually enhances the, you know, basically the variance along line of sight compared to the transverse. Now, if you have smaller and smaller over densities, you can imagine that what's actually going to happen is not this co collective motion. It's going to be the case that there's going to be random velocities inside of this dispersion. Right? And that actually is going to result in a stretching along my site. These are well known, these are kind of God effects. So if you went to a Galaxy survey, does the orientation of those over densities matter at all? Like if you think that the beginning was a pickle instead of just zero. Oh yes. So these are gross implication, right? Right, in a basic spherical over density cartoon, but you know, you are going to have oriented, you know, the distortions in relative space to an extent. But with, if you have, if you, but with the caveat that, of course, you know, if you break down, you know, the velocity of the given object into transverse and line of sight components, this isn't going to distort the apparent position of your source on site. This is because it affects the redshift. So the stretching and squashing will still be only along my sight. But basically, you have effects, um, Pfizer. God, I'm talking your clustering. If you go through any reasonable gas, certainly you'll see, you know, basically, you know, more advanced versions of this kind of correction. But a lot of things, for example, around the BAOs, Baron the Post Constellation, is about identifying galaxy groups so that you can say, okay, I have identified a galaxy group. I think I understand what the, you know, FOG is doing in this group. I am going to correct for that and I'm going to reconstruct the BAO feature a bit better that way. So, these are things that have been well established in the formulas of galaxy surveys. I'm sure there are people in the room who remember um, things like trying to obtain the quadrupole monopole ratio based off of Kaiser effect and trying to constrain the bias galaxies that way, which I think had mixed success. Now, this is, these defects are well understood in the three sources. With line testing method, remember that we're not necessarily interested in discrete sources. We're interested in surveying the continuous line testing field. So in addition, 
to these astrophysical effects that have to do with the motions of the line emitters within over densities, you also have a very simple thing that if you have an over density and you observe it with a finite dish, it's going to look stretched along the line, along the transverse dimensions. And then on top of that, you're observing the spectrometer of finite resolution. So potentially you're also going to see some stretching along the line of sight as well. Fine. So we counter all that first order, not first order, probably not first order, but again, really good on it. Um, yeah, so this is your real space. But it's not what's going on. What you're actually going to observe is something that's much more along the lines of redshift space. With So there is this convention that use this part or new because these effects I'm describing, these are still at a very simplified level. You assume that things are symmetric along the transverse dimensions, and it's only along the line of sight as it said that the distortions happen. In which case, if you have a given wave vector, this is very schematic, this is not really plotting the k vector correctly because it's supposed to be k space, not actual space. Uh, but basically, you can imagine that you're going to have a parallel curve. And so you can find this new parameter, which is just the angle of the wave vector against the one side. So this is so cool here. Basically, the kind of effect what it does. Is this enhancement? It's not super important what this data is, but for completeness, I will note that it is effectively omega n over the bias, which in this case, again, it's something to do with the first moment of the line density model. And then you have some kind of all the finger of God correction that I won't write up because ultimately, for the purpose of my testing mapping, the finger of God corrections happen at small enough scales that by the time you reach that, you're already dominated by shot noise. Question. So that second term, if you square it, so yeah. squaring the whole thing, the yeah. bias then scales out. Specifically, why is the bias scaling up? Well, it's not quite scaling up. Right? Well, I mean, you just take a second term, and you square it, and you multiply by the bias squared in front. Sure. There's no bias dependence. So I was wondering if there's a well, simple explanation for why that is. Well, yeah, so if you square this out, right? So, like, separate it out, that's one bias. One plus fine. Um, but these are higher order corrections, right? So the and the first one is going to be this. The corrections might be, you know, might might not. Do you think I shouldn't worry about the square term because it's negative compared to the product? I mean, for for CO, for example, you know, when we run through calculations based on the bias, which is like two or two and a half, this is like a twenty percent correction on top of the mean. So, well, I guess what you're talking about just geometrically, is there a reason why bias somehow cancels out? Oh, I see that term when it's right. I'm not saying in practice it's cancelled out. Oh, I see what you mean. Conceptually, conceptually. 
Yeah, I do not recall. It has been a while since I read the original papers deriving the results. So we have this EKM new character. This is kind of this this when we write this real space power spectrum, we're kind of assuming, okay, in real space, this is a Gauss random field that's spherically symmetric. So this only depends on the scalar. Now that we have introduced dependence on the angle of the wave vector, we also have to consider. You know, what how this spherical averages out. <laughs> so then you have to decompose it on a logarithmic basis, which is a typical thing. And then you see how L equals zero. This is the monopole. This is the spherical average version. And that has canyon at high order. This is the quadrupole. This is the first order and isomorphies. Because of the way it is formulated here, you're not going to have um, all the logical bases uh, that are all zero. Essentially, what the problem is. Okay. Fine. Um, I won't go into the derivation. It's beyond understanding of the spectrum. It's not. Thing. In particular, the drop noise doesn't really appear in the quadruple. And Russian space. So at that point, you might expect, okay, well, this has this is the same thing as real space, but with the clustering enhanced a little bit by this Kaiser effect. And then this, because of the Kaiser effect, has gone from non anisotropic to anisotropic, and this is some kind of pure measure of the clustering. Uh, so this result. The instrumental revolution, um, which introduces extra anisotropies on top of the actual things going on in register, from real space and register space. You have to go from register space to the actual data cube space. Um, and then I will only write. So if you go to this paper, um, I derive the full coefficients. The derivation is not terribly interesting, but rest assured, there is some. Component modifying the matter power spectrum with some clustering bias. And this mixes in shot as well. And the way the P shot mixes in depends on the instrumental parameters and how that stretches or squashes the CO intensity field or the line intensity field. Are these fellows referring to the multiple moments or uh, the multiple moments, but uh, basically you know, if I write out the full thing, what's really going on is you're decomposing this as a big under piece of Legendre moments. So we're saying, okay, here L of A is two L plus one, two, and control N mu. Remember, this is a this is the cosine of an angle. And then the John polynomials of order L. So that you have expanded this. Quantity in the basis of the general form. So 
yeah, we still call them multiples. Um, so you have L of zero multiple, L of two multiple, et cetera. But it's a it's not a spherical expansion, really. It's an expansion in, in this mu parameter. And so the monopole is just an isotropic part. The L equals two part is like the most initial sort of antitropies in terms of strength and slosh. And then L4 and so on are higher order entities. So basically, the full expressions are. Um, yeah, the composer, I'll respect you. You said there are no shot notes. No, there is shot notes, what I said. Um, yeah, so I erased this because uh, I was writing a little jumper expansion, but basically, there is going to be, unless your instrument response is not perfect, you are going to stretch and squash things yeah. because of the beam resolution and the frequency resolution. And so that is going to mix shot noise into a vulnerable, which is then no longer a pure measure. And in fact, and in our simulations, the shot noise kind of completely dominates the flow. It's shot noise, like still uh, even. Yeah, in real space, the shot noise is still. So, uh, so the bubble is still the shot noise. So, here, I can sketch out. Uh, yeah, so I guess I should actually plot and represent it in sort of yeah, you know, similar to the graph. It looks like so you have this is your clustering, this is your shot noise. And typically, yeah, I'm I'm literally looking at the chamber right now, and for reasonably realistic parameters. This crossover happens around one. So basically, this crossover we expect to typically happen around quasi linear to non linear scales. And large scales would so, certainly be dominated by the clustering. So, yeah. Uh, Also send that the shot noise or with the second one so the master function. Yes. Uh, so the second one with the master function should also be related to the uh, wave factor k. Right. But uh, the shot noise goes constant with k. So that's the Why would the Lukowski function be related to k? Because the wave factor did change the uh, yields that you are looking for the Lukowski function. Okay. So when I say luminosity function. What I mean is dn over di. It is the distribution of uh, you know distribution of objects at different luminosities. Yeah. That is what I mean by yeah. luminosity function, um, and that is not a thing that has you know spatial structure inherent in it. Right. That is just saying okay, this many sigmoids live at this luminosity range. This many a little bit strange. You can fit a nice checker function to it, and you can fit you know more complicated forms to it if you want, because it's probably not really a press checker form. Um, but that is what I mean by the velocity function. It's not the it's not the T of X. It's not the field. So yeah, sorry, I should clarify that terminology. But Yes. Now you have modifications. I'm not writing the question marks because these aren't trying to be understood. They're saying these are going to depend severely on the instrument parameters. We're going to do the like scalings on top of the stretch space set. Okay. So that's fine. That's all well and good. Right. You still understand the response of the line of the field to the dark matter field as a function of some kind of bias parameter that is determined by your model for line of the Except, no, you don't. 
So as I said, if you have a CO emitter, CO emitters are not going to be point sources. Right. So in the transverse dimension, probably doesn't matter too much because your beam is massive compared to the size of an individual gallon compression, two to three or whatever. In the line of type dimension, though, uh, remember how I said that for CMF, for example, the science canalization roughly corresponds to a, uh, the line width of individual emitters that are, that are observed? Yeah, so that's going to end up mattering because this is an additional parameter on top of your native spectrometer frequency resolution that basically stretches out the loops your plant has much region on my site. So what you're saying is that the circular velocity of galaxies are more 200 kilometers a second. Your resolution of your instrument is 300 kilometers a second. Yes. So they're comparable. Yeah, they're comparable. And it's not unlike with the size of the beam versus the size of the galaxies in angular space, that's not negligible. Way, way yeah, that's not negligible. So then you realize this is not good. What you also need to model then is this, or this is your velocity width. So you can go look at the data, which is kind of scant for these things. But if you actually go look at the data that do exist, you know you can. Lot of things like L prime, the CO line luminosity versus the full with that max. Right. And what we really want to be able to model is something across the whole range here. Unfortunately, what we really only have are like these. Um, I mean, there are a lot of other unconfirmed sources as well. So, that's that. There are plenty more. But the point of the matter is this is fine. It's modeling the most extreme galaxies that are individual observable in surveys like with Alma, but it's not really helping us model things here. So, we need to end up with somewhat stronger assumptions than we would like. And this is a gene. So, one of the questions is well, what is what are these galaxies doing at high redshift? Because you can imagine that these galaxies could be dispersion dominated or rotation dominated. By which I mean, okay, this is, just, this is just some kind of elliptical mess where there's just thermal velocities flying all over the place, and that's what results in alignment. Or is it a case where there is a variable disk like structure and there's coherent rotational velocities, and that's what results in? Fact of the matter is, these data aren't the, the kinematic data here aren't really quite good enough to really constrain which of these two scenarios it is. But it will matter when we're trying to model these things because if it's dispersion dominated, there's no dependence on the orientation of the galaxy towards us. If it's rotation dominated, then you have to consider okay, well, if it's edge on, great, we get some kind of line up here. If it's face on, right? It's much narrower. It's in fact going to be limited by the dispersion, intrinsic dispersion of the gas inside the galaxy. So these are the kind of details that are mattering when we're trying to model the velocity. So in this paper, we kind of did the kind of simplest, stupidest thing. We assumed galaxies are mostly the galaxies that emit in CO are mostly going to be disk-like, and we assumed you know randomized inclinations uh, to try and this um, and we basically try to match 
you know, some kind of halo model for e of n to this sort of high luminosity sample, then you can end up with reasonable prescriptions that just depend on the impossible that we can say, okay, on well, characteristic scale for velocities related to halo mass is going to be the girl velocity. Just G of M for R and related entirely to the spread over that C and Psi. So that's fine. Um, so you can say, okay. You can kind of, we have this kind of characteristic velocity scale related to the halo mass, and we can kind of use that to guide some kind of velocity scale that then gets overall normalized to match the distribution of actual observed black curve class. Fine. Um, so then now your response function isn't just the luminosities anymore. In fact, now for a given halo on the sky, not only are you painting a brightness to it, you're actually trying to say, okay, how well is, what is the profile of that brightness in space? What is, what is the line of sight profile? And then, of course, call it back to the things that we were discussing before. How does it get smeared out additionally by things like the instrumental resolution? So, in the simplest halo model, you're really just thinking about these things as delta functions, but this is not tenable because the emitters aren't point sources and they have all these kind of peculiarities. This holds for other light emitters as well, but I just see that as an example because that's the one I started with. And that's the one that specifically is dealt with in the behaviors as well. But the point is, yes, not point sources need to paint finite size profiles. This complicates things beyond this picture, um, where we're already dealing with this kind of resolution, uh, because then this factor formerly depended on things that apply uniformly to the land density field. So it can have things of different brightness going across the sky. Right? right. The instrumental beam applies the exact same way to all of these. The beam width doesn't change because the scale emitter is the more or less or less massive. The instrumental resolution is not going to change for different populations of CO emitters. But the light width might, right? You can entirely imagine a case where less massive galaxies see a lot less distinctly. Probably can't see this. I'm up close here looking at the black one. But what I'm trying to depict is a situation where, yeah, actually, a massive galaxy might have significantly more dispersed line profile compared to a galaxy that is, you know, quite small, not a lot of energy um, going on. So this complicates the picture of how this tire track gets distorted in your observation. But it's important to get right because it's still part of what you're trying to learn. What happened? Yeah. Sorry, most of the part of this here is it not feasible to take a small patch of the sky and just map out individually all the galaxies and test you know, your uh, monitoring that way? So you can't do that. I'm hoping this you do not have enough. Yeah, but nonetheless, you know, how are you going to figure this out? Right, and the and the 
And the issue is, yes, you're right, you kind of can't. So this is what I was talking about, right? Where we do have these data points at yeah. very high in right? And you can kind of say, okay, well, okay, that's the best start. Yeah. I mean, some of that systematic, and some of that, and, you know, not a negative fraction of the impact has to be right. You know. Yeah. I mean, what, ideally, right, you would also want somewhat deeper integrations to try and get a kinematics of analysis at lower ranges. Yeah, yeah. So that you could compare the bulk. It's, it's, it's truly compare the bulk. Exactly. Right, to the situation. Exactly. So, um, so can we ask, so that the data set you're talking about there, is that from ALMA, the high luminosity one, or is that from earlier observations from other arrays? Um, so it's mostly, so because this, so in the context of this work in particular, it's actually a combination of two surveys, one of which was a VLA only hold, uh, like holds that survey. So this is just C1 to zero um, certain dividend detections. And there was also a separate program that was, I can't believe we named it that, Flospex? So there's ASPEX, right, which is an ALMA program, but it's looking at higher JCO lines. And so, right. So, right, right, so people, just yeah. people a better feel. So first of all, you were talking about the resolution for CO maps like arc minutes. What's yeah. the field of view of Alma? The field of view of Alma is also going to be on that order. Okay, so in principle, you can do what Chris is saying. Take one really deep image of Alma. Yeah. And you get one pixel. Yeah. In your CO map. Yeah. And you just sit on it forever so you get these really low luminosity galaxies. And you get the redshift because you see the line. Yeah. So you could, in principle, do what Chris is saying. In principle, yes. I have not run the sensitivity calculator to see how long it would take to push the L prime plus one down from here to so so here. on there. What is where is L star in these plots roughly? We have to take an L star galaxy redshift of whatever two. Oh, so I don't know. So if you're looking at L prime CO, yeah, this might come to the Uh, yeah, and basically. Aspects is plus something that's above 10 to the 10 and less CO luminosity in terms of K kilometers per second per per part squared or whatever. So and, and just to give us like an idea, like the Milky Way is also order. What is it? I think somewhere in this range. Yeah, so that's below below this place. Yeah. Somewhere, somewhere, somewhere a little bit below. And then going back to Chris's original question, if you know, integrate over the you know DNDM for the halos. Yeah. The bulk of it does still come from roughly L star. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, the thing to note is that, you know, these galaxies are already kind of coming from fairly large programs on these community instruments. You know, all aspects was a large program. Bullset was not a small program either. They spend hundreds of hours integrating on these, you know, square minute tier fields. Right. Um, to get Really, you know, not not so triple digit so, so that's their problem. They can't sit on they can't get enough time on any of these instruments to see well, any of these different galaxies. Well, not going to be an effort for the next decade. That's true. Yeah. You could do it every year for the next for you know, um, yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 yeah, there are definitely strategies, like right? right. Um, I think people have also looked at trying to leverage, you know, calibrator um alterations on all of them, for and example, they, to do they, they convince attack. You know, to spend another, you know, weeks worth of observing time versus everybody else to get, you know, the square root of two better information. And that's not easy to do. Yeah. So I'll probably start wrapping up, but the point is, yeah, now this modification, which was already dependent on the ESMR parameters, now it's even odder, you know, if you write out, you know, what the explicit expression is going to look like right it's going to really look something along the lines of okay so if you just write out part of the p clustering right it's going to be and right, function of k and u this is what it look like right you have matter part spectrum what is the bias with which this scales the matter part spectrum modulo unit numbers which are not in this Gonna look something like our original integral effectively over the luminosity function.
right? And then, of course, you have the Heiser effect. Um, so that modifies it a little bit. And then you have this exponential because, of course, because we're trying to model this in the simplest analytic way, we assume all of the profiles, the beam, the spectral resolution, the line profiles, we assume they're all Gaussian because that's the simplest thing. Um, basically, if you put it through that machinery, you say, okay, then there's this modification, A squared beam scale squared. And then on top of that, now you also have A squared sigma B squared corresponds to the line profile. And that now depends on the halo mass. Uh, and then, so, these are all the effects that go into trying to estimate what is actually observable. You have the metapower spectrum. This is, in the first instance, scaled by some kind of integral over the Lagrange function, but then you have retrospective space distortions. You have instrumental resolution, and then you have extra things like this line profile. So lots of different modifications go out to the observables. Does the redshift distortion from the dust scale differently than it does for the line emission? Uh, oh, I probably just wrote it differently. Um, because basically, yeah, if you just, you know, rewrite it as this one plus but then square is. Oh, yeah, the square is here. Oh, okay. yeah, sorry. <laughs> yeah. It's just because everything has been rewritten. And now, yeah, you have to integrate first over this effect and then square it. Whereas before, it would have just been much simpler because you have no mass dependent profile modifying you know, the contribution from each halo mass spin to the total signal. Now, this exists. Yeah. And one of the outcomes of this work in particular was we asked the question can you simplify this by saying, Given some kind of model here, right? Can you just approximate everything as an effective velocity scale? Just something that modifies, roughly modifies everything overall by the same velocity scale. The answer is yes, kind of for the you know first instance, is fairly average power spectrum you, that you can kind of get away with that. But then other observables start misbehaving, things like you know, the distribution of fossil intensities in your map, things like how the astrophotics work out. These things get distorted significantly enough that you really need to model this completely. So that's where the current state of things is. Um, and of course, even this is the full story. So I'll sort of end off by talking about future ways in which this picture of your response function of your Gaussian function becomes even more complicated um, and trying to estimate the observables, which, sorry. Jesus Christ, this okay. Let's be recorded. I know. <laughs> At least four years ago, you weren't recording my talk. Um, but okay, we have so far considered the luminosity for a given halo mass and the velocity profile for a given halo mass for each dark matter halo in isolation. But we know that isn't right. Right. For example, this idea of you know dispersion dominated versus rotation dominated. These kinds of galaxies will live in different kinds of environments within the thing I raised that I really shouldn't have done. You know, you know, within this massive cosmic web that you're trying to get a handle on, you know, depending on where a given galaxy lives, you know, in a, at a node, in the middle of a filament, inside a wall, whatever, 
you may expect different types of galaxies to live in different parts of this cosmic web. So just saying you can encapsulate things with other language, you know, that, that, might, that might hold approximately, but there's going to be some bias of galaxy types in respect to the large cell structure. The other thing, of course, is even you know, after you divide this up into this version versus the picture dominated, you have to think about okay, so I have a galaxy, like a rotation dominated galaxy, that's in the vicinity of a filament, but the filament and the galaxy are going to interact. Um, and this is a topic that has come up. The alignment of you know the vorticity of these kind of cosmic web features with the spins of these galaxies. That is going to produce additional bias um, in the way in which this this feature across your observable field. So the relation of these quantities, which we have so far modeled um, for without a real eye to large hole structure, the models of these relations ultimately will need to take into account the cosmic web that these luminosities are lighting up with these velocities. So that's going to be an important direction, I think, going forward as line of mathematics science grow, as they move beyond initial detection to really try to understand the observables that they're seeing on the sky. So, um, um, additional question. Yeah. Can you summarize why you're doing one of these? What are you trying to get out of scientific? So, scientifically, the key motivation is to access the epochs that you cannot access with conventional techniques, right? Um, yeah. If you paint out the cosmic history, you know, low cosmic web, great, slow, then the it'll be sorted out. Um, when you're at the Asian epoch cosmic web, as it, such as it would be, is going to be well beyond the reach of any conventional kind of public surgery. You find the measure of the PAO. We're trying to, yeah, so one of those back in the region of the Yeah, I read what you. Else, what else do you find? So, one other, one other motivation ultimately for these experiments is to go after the morphology and randomization, right? So, you have 21 centimeter experiments sure. going after the IGM. You have a uh, scale experiments, you could experiments going after the ionizing sources. And you try to measure things like size of the ionized bubbles. Oh, so, 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 be expected to probe the ionization? Ultimately, yes. That's what we're scaling up towards. To begin with, we're aiming towards a lower retro grade, yeah. right? Where there's peak star formation, there's a bright signal that we can find a lot uh, And we'll still learn interesting things because. So you'll um, measure, I get an independent measure of the star formation rate as a function of. Exactly. But getting the BAO peak at a, at a range of is very valuable for the as well. state of the universe, right? Yes. So eventually, as the experiments kind of scale up and go towards larger and larger fields, that will become possible. In the first instance, we're basically trying to get things like luminosity functions, integrated SFR densities, molecular okay. gas densities, things like that. But ultimately, you know, at, 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 at an immediate range, we want to do that sort of thing. At higher range, we want to go after defining the first of radiation. So, but you can't in principle constrain things like W as a function of exactly. No, I mean, YAO has a function of, but if you get a fine grained measure of YAO, it is one of the positive expansion. That's the goal. That is one of the goals, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, time is explicitly going after YAO scale. Also, the, your point about the seal at high rates, I mean, the first generation of stars don't come with seal, but you're like well, immediately after. Well, this is, I guess, what I was wondering because I mean, there's always the conversion factor, and it's very intrinsically interesting to know what the CL emission is going to be. Yeah, just volume and average. Yeah, but you're not going to be able to get an accurate measure of the star formation out of it. Well, what you will get is you will, there'll still be a good tracer of the large scale structure at yes. time of reading. Oh, yeah, 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 absolutely. And, and the point is that CO turns on like immediately as soon as the first star shows. Yeah. yeah, which is when the realization it cast weightless. Well, I think it's starting to. Yeah.
And if you want to understand, you know, the morphology of granulation, the morphology of you know, star formation across larger scales, then it's really important to start understanding these environmental biases that come into the CO signal in terms of finding water, the response of the lightning loss to the presence of dark matter halos. So, for London, yes. Your board work is reminiscent of famous American artist Cy Fine. I <laughs> will keep that in mind. <laughs> so it would be helpful. It's like you were talking about the presence of the velocity. So you've done these calculations a bunch, you know the magnitude of it before you do that correction. Yeah. What fractional change is it when you include velocity? Yeah. So rotations. That's why I have this paper open. Right. So Most of this. Uh, where, despite the artistic merits, board work. Okay, so different steps, right? So this, if this is your real space fire, so I'm trying. Okay, in the first instance, you're gonna have to explore that by theme, and then in the second instance, you have this additional. Okay, you can do the line wrong. If you plot this out, so something like this. That's your one. That's in megaparsecs. Yeah. Um, so basically, the attenuation doesn't really become significant until you start reaching the scale. With you, at, at which point, CO map, you know, the beam is kind of smoothing down a lot anyway. Right. So you don't expect these sensors to happen. So, oh, so let's think of this as a relative attenuation. So there's no attenuation here, and the thing is entirely attenuated down here. The, the power that you're trying to measure, it, it's not gonna be you're losing you power because it's being smeared out by this rotation of you know, yeah. galaxies. And so you're underestimating. When you, when you do your measurement, you're underestimating the actual power. Yeah. That's the whole thing, right? You start out with this nice real space signal, and then retrospace, you know, retrospace distortion kick in, squash things around. Then some resolution kicks in, smears things out, and then the line profiles smear things out further. So you can see that as you go through each of these steps, the line intensity variance is going to become less and less. So, but, but let's go back to like the C and B type things. In terms of L, that's a, a mega press exercise of a big cluster. Yeah. But in terms of L, it's like 10,000. Yeah, it's quite high. It's like 10 to the fourth. So it's already it's a much higher L than the C and B. Numbers. And you can do it in any redshift you want. So you get this really fine measure, which goes to very high L. At any range, if you like, up to you know, whatever thirty, and so that's that's the attraction of this whole thing. And then and then your corrections, as you say, they're turning on at maybe a few tens of uh, you know megaparsecs, so a few tenths of a inverse megaparsec. So you're getting to very high, very actually by cosmological standards, very fine resolution. Yeah. Okay, and those, but those corrections, like you say, they're factor two at, at five at five megaparsecs. Yeah, for half of half a megaparsecs. Yeah. And the other corrections you're talking about are going to be at the same sort of resolution, but it's... they're going to stack up off each other. But you know, right. Um, basically, um, in terms of line broadening, one one of the reasons we wanted to. Figure out things out was because there are these inter interferometric surveys, yes, which will be significantly more effective because they operate out here. And so, we wanted to see if, uh, you know, we wanted to detect that. Well, then that'll make a much bigger difference. Yeah. So, they do, you know, they, they, they do correct for this by, you know, basically excising a lot of, you know, high K parallel modes and things like that from there, you know, power trigger estimation. But, um, yeah, we ultimately ended up basically agreeing on the size of the effect of the. With, with the constant light people, which is 
Thanks. Are there any more questions? Well, then let's start the speaker.